Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Workers' Mic, powered by the Midwest Coalition of Labor, right here on 720 WGN. I'm Ed Maher with the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 150, and joining me today is Phil Davidson from the Mid-America Carpenters Regional Council. Happy Sunday, Phil. Happy Sunday, Ed. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Um, of course, you're filling in for, for Ken, and we've been you know, fielding calls from all over the country with Ken sightings, and uh, most recently... What's the latest? Yeah. The latest, I think you told me, was that uh, Ken uh, caught a shark. Caught a shark. Yeah, I did see that. catching a shark in the state of New York, so... You know, it's uh, that's wait. Pretty... He did that in New York. He did that in New York. The I shark... thought he was in Florida. I think he's in New York. Okay, that's what I heard from you. I thought, but anyway, I mean, it's good to know because we've been can without you catch a catch uh... sharks in the Atlantic up there, the Northeast. Apparently, you can. Okay, I think he went we'll down into it. the water, took a swing at one, and just dragged <laughs> it back to the shore. So you know, we've been without a hero since the loss of the. Crocodile I assume and... we should find out the order. I assume it was during his travel to Florida where he was. Going to see his friend Ron DeSantis, and a shark, a shark got in the way of. Well, Ken versus shark. <laughs> it sounds like Ken won, shark nothing. So keep it going, Ken. We yeah. hope to hear from you soon. We miss you dearly. Yeah, what a what a guy, a man <laughs> of many talents. Absolutely. So um, on today's show, we are going to have a special guest, and that is Doctor Professor Rosemary Foyer. She's a um, a professor of labor history from Northern Illinois University. The illustrious Northern Illinois yeah. University, my alma mater, uh, and places the place that I've left, you know, much of my dignity kind of like just scattered across the sidewalks. Is your jersey uh, still hanging from the rafters there? Probably yeah. somewhere. Okay. Yeah, they, they haven't forgotten. Okay. Um, and then she's also the director of the Mother Jones Heritage Project. And she's going to come in to tell us a little bit more about Mother Jones, who was, you know, a giant in the American labor movement, but someone that also. A lot of folks don't know anything about, so I'm looking forward to uh, to she be really interested. She is a, a true badass, if I can say that on the air. I think you um, can. She's dead. there's there's an actual um, there's a new uh, display for her, and it's going to be at our Carpenters Training Center in St. Louis called Dangerous Women, and she's the feature subject of it. So that's funny. Yeah, she is the original dangerous woman. Who called her a dangerous woman? The uh, the the person who was uh, you know in charge of a corporation that she was trying to raise wages at. Probably That's a dangerous woman. <laughs> Probably yes. Yeah, they that call them nasty like women. They call them dangerous term for women. Then. Yeah. Yeah, it's a like a badge of honor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay, so a true true tough lady. She was. Yeah. She was. Um, and she. Uh, so we'll learn more about that in the next segment. Um, but uh, before that, I wanted to touch on something. I know, Phil, you you were talking about this too. The uh, the Biden administration came out with some big news for uh, the building trades this week, and it was uh, the expansion of the prevailing wage laws nationally. And we talk about prevailing wage laws as yeah. being sort of like a minimum wage for construction workers, uh, any construction worker that's working on a project funded by federal dollars. Yes, and of course, Davis with all, Bacon, right, Davis Bacon. So. All of these um, these bills that have been coming out of Washington, whether it's the the Chips Act or the bipartisan infrastructure plan, they all mandate uh, prevailing wage to be paid on any projects that you know are funded through these programs or where corporations get subsidies what, for like a battery plant, something like that. Right. With with the idea being, if you're going to use taxpayer dollars to pay somebody, mm -hmm. you better pay them the best wage right. and benefit package possible. You don't want to nickel and dime someone when, hey, we're the one footing the bill. We're not looking to cheap people out of a fair wage. Right. So a lot of folks, a lot of companies that have been building these factories and these plants have been taking these subsidies and making plans to build them in the South where uh, unions really aren't as prevalent and they think that they can probably just take advantage of a lower wage workforce and still get some of this money. So part of That the comes Biden... from all over the country. That doesn't even mean sure. they're from the South. I mean, they could be coming from another another country even right like, yeah so the biden administration has said uh that these these subsidies this funding um is supposed to be benefiting workers it's part of um you know not a trickle down economy but a middle out economy or a bottom up economy making life better for the workers that are working on these projects yeah. so what they did was um they updated some of the rules um that had been uh taken away uh by by president reagan back in the 80s yep. and now these prevailing wages uh, will apply to more workers in the South. I think it's a lower threshold that has to be met for union wages uh, or, or these higher wage yeah, rates. Yeah, it's 30% of uh, a workforce in a given trade in a given area. Right. Right. So, so it used to be 50%. So obviously mm -hmm. when you have 50%, there's a lot more low-wage people in there that are using to come with an average 
right. of what you're going to pay someone. When it's 30%, now you have more of – it's more offset by the higher paid union mm-hmm. workforce. So this is a rule that's being made uh, and announced through the Department of Labor, um, but it's going to make a big difference. Yeah. And uh, Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, made the announcement, I want to say, in Pennsylvania this past week. Uh, but it's huge news, and it's going to raise wages for construction workers all across the country – um, so it is good news, uh, absolutely. It's huge. Yeah, and um, so just wanted to report on that. That's it's always good to hear that uh, you know with the stroke of a pen, uh, with the issuance of a rule, people across the country will see their pay go up. So that's great news. Yeah, um, way, way to build the middle class. Yeah, I mean, um, this is the way you got to do it. Right on. So we've got to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be here with Professor Rosemary Foyer, and uh, we hope you'll stick around. Very excited. It should be a great show. So come back to us right here at the Worker's Mic on 720 WGN. Welcome back to the Worker's Mic on 720 WGN. I'm Phil Davidson with the Mid-America Carpenters Regional Council, along with co-host Ed Maher from Local 150, the Operating Engineers. And we have a special guest with us today. We have Professor Rosemary Foyer from Northern Illinois University. She is a professor of labor history, and we are very excited to have her today. Welcome, Professor Foyer. Thank you. Call me Rosemary. We'll call you Rosemary. You good with that? Pleasure to have you in, Rosemary. I'm a, you know, you're a professor at Northern Illinois, Illinois University. That's my uh, alma mater. So Excellent. good to be with yeah. a fellow Husky. Excellent. Yes. Fantastic. So uh, in addition to being the, um, the uh, pro- uh, professor of labor history, you're also the director of the... Mother Jones Heritage Project and the statue campaign, the Mother Jones statue campaign for the city of Chicago, which we've proudly announced we're going to get a Chicago monument to Mother Jones. So tell us a little bit about Mother Jones. I mean, uh, there might be a lot of listeners who aren't familiar. So Mother Jones is a a giant in the labor history community. Tell us a little bit more. Anybody who works for a living should know about Mother Jones. Everybody who struggles to make ends meet can relate to her story. Uh, She was a, a, a person who struggled with deep poverty, went through poverty, famine, plague, uh, you know, lost all her children, lost her husband, was completely bereft, and decided to make her way in the labor movement, that the labor movement was the way out of poverty, was the way to empower workers. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that if people see themselves struggling, uh, think of Mother Jones and think of uh, the fact that she took her sorrow and her pain and realize that you have to make your way collectively Uh that was her message and she was she's a giant in the in american labor history Mm -hmm. but she was an immigrant from ireland yes uh, so the fee the famine part Mm -hmm. of her history came from cork where a million people within a few years died from the so-called potato famine but for her she lived in cork where they would transport food from the countryside uh to the port of the River Lee. So she lived right next to the River Lee and the butter market was right next to her. Here are death carts, you know, being hauling away the bodies at night and food is being transported out. Right. So that's a class experience. Yeah, as and, an as an Irish you know, a, a child of two Irish parents, uh, don't even get me started on the, on the famine. The famine, <laughs> right. yeah. And, and what was her connection to Chicago, specifically? Well, she didn't come here at first. Her father and brother left, as a me- number of uh, immigrants from Cork did, and went on the famine ships, if you've heard, uh, ever heard of those. Terrible mm-hmm. conditions, lots of loss of life. Ended up in Canada, in Toronto, after living in Vermont for a couple of years. Then she they saw she was just a very bright young girl they were trying to educate these Irish immigrants and she went to um, the Toronto Parliament and you know listened to debates so there was a little bit of 
energy that people saw in her. They educated her to be a teacher. She thought she'd be a teacher. She went to Monroe, Michigan. That She said she didn't like bossing little children. Mm -hmm. And so she went to Memphis for whatever reason. Anyway, that's where she met her husband. He was a labor organizer. She looked like she was going to get married, have a bunch of kids like Irish immigrants tended to do. (laughs) And uh, then the yellow fever hit. And as she says in her autobiography, Um, All of the uh, rich people left, and the poor people were left with uh, the fever, which is excruciating. She lost all four kids and her husband within a matter of a week. Um, So it was a horrible thing. She went to Chicago to see her sister, though. Apparently, her sister Mm -hmm. was living here, and uh, she became a dressmaker. That was one of the skills she had built, and um, she seemed like she was on the rise again. (laughs) And then the (laughs) Chicago fire, the great Chicago fire happened. She lost. She had worked for the wealthy people, you know, and she said she observed out of the plate glass windows the deep poverty on the lakeshore. But then she was on the lakeshore Mm -hmm. in the aftermath of the fire, just in terrible straits. Um, And it was the fire, she said, that transformed her. Even though her husband had been a labor organizer with the Molders Union, still it was that moment where she saw all the relief that was sent to help poor people survive the fire was gathered up by the wealthy. In fact, the wealthy were saying, if you want relief, uh, if you're a woman, you should become a servant in order to get the relief. Right. Really? So this was the kind of class system that was being built. And she said that was when she began to think, to read, and to act. Mm-hmm. So it's a particular moment in Chicago's history that is usually told as, you know, rising from the ashes, but it also threads with the labor movement of Chicago. Not yeah. many people know it's the fire, the, the fire that built the labor movement. Yep. And it's women, especially who were involved in that labor movement, when the Chicago elite saw that um Working class men were, as they said it, letting their women protest in the streets, right? right? Um, and uh, they thought it was a sign of uncivilization or the uh, dismantling of civilization. Really? And they started forming their anti labor. Um, groups. They didn't want to have these immigrants take power. Well, Mother Jones saw it as a different moment. And one of the things that we're doing with the Chicago statue, statue is calling it, um, we shall rise, mm-hmm. right? So not rising as just a city, but rising as a people, immigrants, multi-ethnic, multiracial labor movement, rising from that fire and rising to Uh, suggest that contrary to the way the fire was handled, people needed to be considered first. And that's the broad way she thought of the labor movement, Mm -hmm. right? That it was not just the um, you know, the trades. There were bricklayers and there were people who were in the trades that were Um, is what we think of the union movement then. She would have thought the unemployed movement and those protest movements were part of this broad labor movement. And she was one of the co-founders of the Industrial Workers of the World, which is, you know, anybody can join that. And that is just about being a part of, you know, the the, the struggle to to lift workers up. Right. And that, I mean, that came in 1905. That's one of the places that we'd like to mark along with this Mm -hmm. uh, um, monument to her this uh, statue is to place some of those locations that are not yet marked. Industrial workers of the world real lot was realizing some of those values, which is this is not just a movement about you know skilled workers. It's a movement for everybody. And right. she was one of her biggest causes throughout her 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 years of activism, uh, her many years of activism was to fight against the use of children. Yes. Right? She saw children as part of the labor movement. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing. So you have reformers like Jane Addams, who people recognize that name a little bit more. Right. But, you know, she was saying, let's do for the children what Mother Jones do. She gathered up the children and said, 
you're in charge, you know, march to the president's residence. The president was like, I can't do anything about child labor. What's that about? And yet she took these children and she really had this knack of teaching child laborers that despite their exploitation, it was only they who could change things. That's her message. And I think that's a message that should resonate today, that it's not about the great leaders of the labor movement. It's really about how are you going to change the labor movement and therefore transform society. And she was very involved with the coal miners, right? Yes. As well. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about that. I mean, when you think of organizing in strikes today versus what was going on 150 years ago, I mean, people were dying during right. strikes, there oh, was, yeah. I mean, and not only dying, d- dying every day. And I mean, there were 13 miners who died per day. Never made headlines. Yeah, I mean, through, through violent right. actions. No, well, yeah. no, no, I'm it's saying in the, in the mines, in the mines as well, because they didn't have safe working conditions. And yeah. in addition to that, we had the most violent labor movement besides Russia yeah. at this time. So people think of Czarist Russia as an autocracy. For workers, it was uh, undemocratic life where you couldn't even protect your own life. Plus, they sent goons and thugs to kill you. Mm -hmm. Or to intimidate you. I mean, the main goal of these goons and thugs was to create violent, and this is the same thing that happens today, you know, to to create violence so they could get a legal injunction to break your strike. Mm -hmm. So it was um, intended as violence, and she used her grandmotherly, you know, if you look at this image here, a lady who might be your grandmother, she'd walk right up to the bayonets, right, Mm -hmm. and say, She'd fake them out half the time. She'd say, you know, if you if you kill me, there's a thousand men up in the woods who are going to come and get you, you know. <laughs> but it was that. And the men would say, I can't. She was can't. brave. She, and she would say, people think I'm getting away with this because I'm a woman. But really, I'm just braver than most of those men. <laughs> you know, most of those men would never be able to do that. And she'd tell women that, too. And I think that's important to remember because people think, oh, she was really part of this manly group of minors. The first thing she'd do is organize the women and children because mm-hmm. she said they're the key to the strike right. and get them on the picket lines. And she'd get those children to face down those bayonets, too. They wouldn't. Her bet was they wouldn't yeah. kill children. <laughs> now, they did in Ludlow, Colorado, and people can go to our website, Mother museum.org yeah, and there's it's... a video that shows you what the Ludlow massacre was I know yeah. we don't have a lot of time but it's it's something that they don't teach in history uh, no. much and so I'm that's children why. were killed during that right yes yeah. uh, women and children were snuffed out yeah. um, by people who were armed thugs that were supposedly the public police, the National Guard in Colorado, but really it was Rockefeller paying them. They put on the right. uniforms of the National Guard. They look like a public police force and they they simply hated immigrants. I mean, it's a time we should never forget. Nobody ever came to justice for the deaths of uh, women and children who were basically, they took kerosene and lit up the camp. The women and children were underneath the ground because they regularly came by with bullet sprays and fired into the tent. So they used to sleep underneath the ground. So, you know, in the dead of night, they're burning these camps out. Um, And it's something that, you know, we go, it goes against the regular notion of history in the United States as some kind of consensus where everybody was in agreement. And we were happy until we were so nostalgic about the past, right? But this is a, yeah, a, a, a story of struggle. And she... Uh, Her famous, one of her famous slogans, she had so many, was struggle and lose, struggle and win, but you must struggle. That without struggle, it's similar to Frederick Douglass, Mm -hmm. you know, there is no progress. And she knew that creating a fighting force of people and a united force that we don't look, think of divisions along race and gender Mm -hmm. and try to unite across all of these uh, multi, uh, multiple categories of ideas and identities that we find a uniting bond uh, that was her hope that one day as she said uh, the last thing she said and it was suppressed tape she said I'm a red I'm a radical I'm an IWW mm-hmm. and I admit to being all they've charged me with I'm anything that would change this moneyed civilization into a higher and grander civilization for the ages to come and I long to see the day when labor will have the destination of the nation in her, her own hands 
and she will stand united force and show the world what the workers could do so she, a powerful symbol yeah she, yes. she was the original nasty woman oh yes <laughs> yeah. in Donald fact and, and when she, she when she died yeah. people said she was unwomanly That's yeah. and a lot of women these days see that quote they're like oh yeah. i hope when they die i say they say i was unwomanly <laughs> right. like her <laughs> well we've got to we've got to take a quick break but yeah. when we come back um, I'd like to get a little bit more into the the monument and mm-hmm. then some more about uh, just kind of current labor history and what you teach your students. So okay. if you're just joining us, we have been talking with Professor Rosemary Foyer from Northern Illinois University and the Mother Jones Heritage Project. So we'll be back right after this uh, with more Workers Mike here on 720 WGN. Welcome back, everybody, to the Worker's Mic right here on 720 WGN. I'm Ed Maher, and I'm here with Phil Davidson. And if you've been listening, we are here with a guest, Rosemary Foyer. She's a professor of labor history from Northern Illinois University and also the uh, director of the Mother Jones Heritage Project. So welcome again, Rosemary. Thank you. And uh, we, have, uh, we spent the last segment talking a little bit about Mother Jones and uh, you know, the importance that she played in Chicago's labor movement and in the American labor movement. So part of the Mother Jones Heritage Project is to erect a monument here in the city of Chicago. So um, where will that be, and is it uh, when's that happening? Well, we uh, hope that it will be within a year, okay, um, or maybe just a little over a year. Mm-hmm. Our goal is September of next year for Labor Day. These things take time, sure. but we're really delighted that it's uh, be able to announce that it's going to be in the water tower. So in the other segment, I was talking about how uh, the Chicago fire had such a profound impact on her and in the, on the labor movement. The name of the monument will be We Shall Rise. And in that sense, it's more than about her history. It's her representing a history. Chicago is a union town. Mm-hmm. And it was really built by a multi-ethnic group, even the water tower, right? It was done with an extraordinary feat of labor, right, to, the, to build uh, this massive tunnel. Miners and others uh, constructed this. And, um, and it's the remnant that survived the fire. And mm-hmm. so we think it's an appropriate place. And in fact, the city did too. We had a number of places we looked at, but we were really delighted that they're giving us this iconic place in Chicago's history to put that statue. The goal of the Monuments Project was to rewrite with a, with a bottom-up history mm-hmm. the monuments. You know, we have all this controversy over monuments. We said, where are the working class women, right? There are none. There's no representation of women, uh, except you know there were a handful, like three Jane Adams hands. Yeah. Uh, now we have Ida B. Wells, but mm-hmm. this is they agreed with us that uh, our uh, our overtures and the enthusiasm of the labor movement from this Chicago Teachers Union to the building trades have really embraced her as a symbol of the past meeting the present yeah in addition to being a woman she's also just an iconic labor leader yes. we don't really have enough of those in chicago either well, that's, that's sure. exactly yeah. right yes that working class people don't have their representation and yet this uh was a movement that shaped her so that's part of the the message it was she was shaped by chicago and then she came back and helped to shape uh Chicago itself. In 1903, she came to Chicago. Why aren't you organizing the domestic workers, these women who clean homes? In in uh, the next year, why aren't there black uh, people represented in the labor movement of Chicago? Mm-hmm. So it was a back and forth kind of challenge. She she came to Chicago in 1910. Said, why aren't you supporting the Mexican Revolution? You're you know, their uh, Taft is going over there and we're uh, imperialist in Mexico. Mm-hmm. So you need to get involved. This is a global labor movement. I mean, right. it's she's an extraordinary she figure, and she everyone. she kept Literally. pushing mm-hmm. the envelope. Let's and was say. and was never afraid to uh, to stand face to face with Pinkertons or armed mm-hmm. guards or yeah. you mm-hmm. know at the oh, tip wait, of a bayonet. I mean, my, one said. of my favorite stories. You know, she got off the train in Chicago and she immediately got handed an injunction by a cop. You know, who said you can't. There was a bricklayers um, strike, and, mm-hmm. and he said you can't you can't join that. And she just went to a garbage can. 
plopped the uh, <laughs> injunction right in the garbage that's rot. It's a bunch of rot. Yeah. And she just what? It's like, you know, and so she'd just say, come join me. Yeah, she was <laughs> And it was, it she didn't think as an individual, it was more that, you know, if we if we do this en masse. Now, a lot of labor leaders wanted to be thought of as respectable. That didn't go she over well. She was a rebel. She just wanted to get things done. <laughs> I saw mm-hmm. the... Uh, Upton Sinclair called her the walking wrath of God. Yes. That's uh, a the pretty, walk, now that's a pretty... <laughs> that's yes. powerful. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to mess yeah. with the walking wrath she of God. She had fight. She had, you know, uh, she was the walking wrath of God. He yeah. also called her life uh, an odyssey. She said. He said when you follow it, she was the odyssey. We yeah. have a map on our website that just has a fraction of where she organized it and it just blows people away. Once we get that map completely, it'll fill, you know, a good part of the United States and Mexico. You know, she just, she also, you know, she went to the South and talked about skin pigment, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the falseness of thinking about skin pigment as a race, uh, as a bar to, uh, you know, anything. And mm-hmm. so she was... You had Brave. To courage. I was going to say it's <laughs> yeah. a very courageous kind of topic to mm-hmm. tackle she in the South at that time. Mm-hmm. So, well, she's, I mean, she's a remarkable figure, and your passion is, you know, is very clear for mm-hmm. her. So, um, you know, congratulations on getting as far as you've gotten so far with the monument. We hope that it'll be completed soon. Well, um, and if I don't, if you don't mind me making a plug, sure, uh, yeah, we're still fundraising for it. We still have 30,000 left to go. And uh, there's an easy way to contribute on our website. Uh, so we need to, um, you know, find the last resources there. We, the city has granted us a lot of money. Mm-hmm. We're really grateful for that. And I think Mother Jones would appreciate that it's, it's a Mellon grant that helped to give us this money. Really? Yeah. Which uh, somebody she fought directly at yeah. her time. Yeah. So now that money is going towards it's come full money. circle. And what's yeah. that website again? MotherJonesMuseum.org. Okay, so if your listeners out there, if if this is something that you think you might be interested in, check that out and maybe donate a few dollars and. Um, you know, before long, you'll be able to come and see what your money went to and check out the the statue, and the exhibit. Beautiful. And people can keep tower. up with the campaign. We'll be announcing progress. Cool. So we talk a lot on this show about, um, you know, the the expansion of child labor, not uh, which it, it, it's just so backwards mm-hmm. um, to what it should be. But um, I, I was just reading a story this morning about a, a judgment against a meat packer in Michigan, mm-hmm. a 17 year old worker lost his hand in a meat packing facility in Michigan. And the, the fine, the, the employer was found guilty of putting a minor in a hazardous situation and failing to secure a work permit and was fined $1,100 mm-hmm. for doing that. So, and it just seems like every week we're on the show and we have another sort of hit, whether it's a story about a, a child being injured at work or just another um, governor in another state celebrating the expansion of children in workplaces, in mm-hmm. factories, in slaughterhouses. In... Looking at you, Arkansas. Yeah, we're still looking at you, Sarah yeah. Huckabee. We don't know what exactly you're looking at, but we're looking at you. Um, but, uh, you know, what do you think Mother Jones would think about the state of child labor today? I mean, what do you think about it? As a professor of labor history, this, this is just outrageous. Uh, well, you know, we've never really eliminated child labor, uh, but now it, we have the kind of politics that develops into, uh, you know, utter, utter, you know, lack of humanity. Mm-hmm. And that's what she would have said. You know, this is uh, this is a decline in civilization. One of the quotes that's on our website is, uh, we have a civilization based on brute force and we want to make it a civilization of justice and love and that's what i think brute force forces children to you know not have a happy childhood and instead to be used to make profits and that's i think the connection between the past and what she said how can we stand by as the um, as these children are chewed up in the mines and mills and tech, you know, textile uh, factories of the past, that's similar to today. You know, right. where they're losing their fingers, or you know, they get sent back to their home countries, or you know, sent into a life of poverty. So she would have uh, she would have wagged her fingers at the bosses, but also at us. Right. I mean, children are being used because they're uh, an easy source of low-cost labor that mm-hmm. won't speak up. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the cover story is that 
it's um, it's a good alternative to using um, undocumented immigrants. So I yes. mean, the truth of it is terrible. Is that how it's being sold? In some places, okay. it's. In, I know in Iowa, it was said you know there wasn't uh, there wasn't enough of a workforce, and some of these right. jobs are being performed or you know by done by undocumented immigrants. So if that's the cover story, the cover story is just as bad as the truth. I mean, they're yeah, they're correct. not doing a very good job of trying to put a happy face on this. And yeah. oddly enough, um, you can see it online. But if you look up in Arkansas, the um, the governor, Sarah Sanders, when she was signing this bill, it was like the expansion of uh, youth labor or something like oh, yeah. that. And that's that's what the bill was called. Well, but, and yeah. The, yeah, they're trying to say that it builds skills oh, it builds for the workplace. Yeah. Of course. But it's the same it's, that happened in the past, sure. you know. And these children, their parents don't feel the pain when their children get into these accidents, mm-hmm. right? They don't have the same kind of love for their children yeah. as we do. It's it's just a projection that allows people to exploit. And she was joined by children when she was signing this bill. And you can see the photo where she's smiling and holding it up and these children, terrified. they're like teenagers, oh, they look terrified. Yeah. They, they put this next to some of the photos of uh, you know, legislation that got kids out of the coal mines where you have children there smiling and celebrating. Yeah. And here in 2023, the kids are just like, wait, you're doing... You're doing what? Yeah, like, so like, yeah. I, I got to go Thanks to school the photo, and then get, go to work after the school, you're telling me now? Like, so I just have no time to, for myself? Like, right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, we've got we've to take a break. Uh, we're just about out of time. But thank you so much for thank coming you. in. Uh, we really appreciate you making time and wish you the very best of luck. Uh, can you give that website one more time yes. for the monument? Mm-hmm. Motherjonesmuseum.org, and, and you would uh, have slash statue okay. for the statue part. Got All it. Right. Well, thank you once again, everybody. Uh, we've uh, been talking with Professor Rosemary Foyer from Northern Illinois University and the director of the Mother Jones Heritage Project. So thanks once again, and we'll be right back with you after this on 720 WGN. Welcome back, everybody, to the Workers' Mic right here on 720 WGN. I'm Ed Maher here with Phil Davidson. And if you've been listening, we just wrapped up an interview with uh, Professor Rosemary Foyer from Northern Illinois University, uh, very passionate about uh, Mother Jones. I learned a lot in that. I thought I, I knew quite a, a bit about Mother Jones, but uh, I learned quite a bit. So Yeah, I think she's pretty much the foremost historian on Mother Jones. You're Is not going right? to find anyone who knows more about it. I, I I can't say that for certain, but I'm pretty sure. Well, the, as I said There's to her, There's probably I mean, someone in Ireland who's like, wait a second, who's this, uh, who's this guy saying this? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's, she knows her stuff. Yes, she certainly does. So hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll be able to, you know, go out to that monument and do a, a live broadcast when they open it up or dedicate it. So yes, it's yes. Certainly, certainly pretty exciting. So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, Phil, I read all over the, you know, all over the country in newspapers, there was an article that had popped up this week. Uh, it was by a writer from the Associated Press who was asking the question, you know, Northwestern University is embroiled in, you know, a pretty enormous scandal right now over the hazing that was going on with its football players. Yeah, a bit uh, of a PR crisis. Oh, it's a nightmare. Yeah, they they, they got rid of their uh, head coach, and uh, I think the university has hired Loretta Lynch, the former U.S. Attorney General, to do an investigation Yes, um, about some of the things that were being done to the players, you know, who, I guess, if they weren't practicing hard enough or if they made mistakes in games, the, the coaches allegedly would single them out and perhaps direct other players to haze them and – you know the details are pretty uh, are pretty unsavory, um, and it's it's really just kind of an unfortunate incident. Uh, Certainly, a black eye on an, yes. know, an otherwise uh, pretty reputable institution. But um, the question that was being asked by this reporter was, um, is this a sign that college players should have unions? College athletes should have unions, and it, you know, it's interesting interesting to think about because I've long thought that uh, that that college athletes should have representation or should be able to join unions, uh, certainly for compensation. Yeah. Um, you know, I believe that players who generate wealth through some of these enormous programs should be able to benefit from some of it themselves. Yep. Um, but uh, I hadn't thought of it in in this way, where a union would sort of be an outlet for them to uh, to take up the fight against things like this that should never be happening. Yeah. Um, but, you know, an interesting question. It it's, would provide some parity with – the whole new NIL situation and uh-huh. being compensated for name, image, likes, whatever it is. And it's, everyone hears about that. It's like, oh, this is a huge money-making opportunity. But it's like any other industry. It's the 1% are making the money. It's your quarterbacks. It's your 
star point guard on the basketball team, but like, you know, the offensive lineman for Oklahoma isn't getting paid a million dollars to play football there, you know, right. switch to a second stringer. So maybe a union could provide some sort of base level compensation for everyone. So it's everyone gets to participate and not only just the top stars. Right. But I mean, in, in this context where it's about having an outlet to report something going on, I mean, I, I played football when I was in high school and, you know, if you, if somebody thinks you're dogging it at practice, you can sometimes get a little bit roughed up or, you know, dealt with harshly by coaches. And yeah. in my experience, that was just, it was how it went and there was nothing to do about it. Now, the details of what was going on allegedly within the Northwestern locker room, that's an, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Um, and ironically enough, the person who's, answer, who's asked this question about whether this um, sort of indicates the need for unions is the same attorney who represented the female athletes from the U.S. women's gymnastics team who, um, you know, they had that uh, that physical trainer, Dr. Larry at, Nasser, at Michigan who's State. probably going to, you know, Rot in jail, rightly for I think he, ten lifetimes. I think he was like I read recently he was shanked or something. Oh, like, is that right? Yeah. I mean, he was a bad. He was yeah, a very, he's very not bad. Dude. Having a good time in no, prison. Nor, yeah. nor, nor should he. A no. Very, very bad guy. But she had secured, I think, a, a nine hundred million dollar settlement for, uh, for the victims of of that guy. But she's she's now taken up the cause, and and I just thought it was interesting. You know, um, I I can't say that, uh, you know, who knows if a union would have prevented this, but it sure yeah. wouldn't have hurt. Uh, it's just one more sort of avenue, and uh, this whole incident has kind of opened eyes for some of the difficulties. You think that you're a D1 student athlete, and you've kind of got it made, but uh, they're they're dealing with some things too, and providing an outlet or a path for these folks to you know report this type of stuff. Yeah, it certainly I, would have been a good thing. I, I liked it. I mean, obviously, a lot of staff is unionized. You're always hearing about graduate students for unionizing. Sure. So yeah, if, especially if you're someone who's generating revenue for the university. Yeah. Um, I just don't know. Like, that'd be a very difficult thing for disciplinary actions uh, and you know football culture. Yeah. How would you bargain? What would be acceptable punishments? I don't know. I, don't know. Like, I mean, yeah. it's it's an interesting question. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I uh, that would just be. I the, like the idea of unions for for yeah. athletes for many reasons, and I think this is just one more argument. Uh, one more argument for it. Yeah, yeah. So. Like, is it permissible to make someone do a hundred suicides if they are late for practice, or what would? The union contracts say about that. You I don't know. know. I like, think we yeah. st- they they got to start at the basics and <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, they'll work their way up to this. That's right where my stuff, mind goes. Yeah. Who know, who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, another thing that happened this week that I thought had a, a pretty interesting tie to some of the things that have gone on in Illinois was I read about and I think it was big national news that Ohio had an election this week to uh, it was over whether or not to make it harder to um, amend the constitution. On, uh, on the ballot via yeah. popular vote. Yep. Right. So uh, the question was, th- they were there were advocates uh, who were trying to make it, you know, protect the the current status of the Constitution, make it uh, possible to change the Constitution through you Go know ballot measures. Simple majority to I think sixty percent was right. what they tried so, to change it to. Right? So the folks who were trying yeah. to make it harder for the people to change the Constitution wanted to raise that threshold from 51% or 50% plus one yep. up to 60%. And they also wanted to add some requirements that uh, petitions had to be received from signers in, in, every, each county? in every county <laughs> yeah. rather than, yeah. I think, half the counties. Yeah. So they were just trying to make it harder for yeah. the people to impact their own constitution, to vote on, yeah. to change their own constitution. Yeah. Um, and a lot of this has to do with uh, an upcoming um, abortion measure, I think, that's coming up in, in their next general. Yeah, I can't remember I if think it's this fall a, or next. There's a ballot initiative to codify the right to have an abortion okay. in Ohio is what it stems from. Right, and I think that's that's a big part of this issue. But there are other issues. I mean, Ohio has long been something where uh, laws like right to work were attempted and were defeated by the people. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the supporters of you know, making it more difficult to amend the Constitution were our dear friend Dick Uline yep. from Illinois, who is, uh, you know, he's still, he runs Uline, it's a packing supply company, and he's still at that company, has a dress code that requires uh, female employees to wear skirts that I've are heard that. below yeah. the knee. Yep. Um, you know, he's living in a different decade, Yeah. Uh, but he's, he's he spends un, just insane amounts of money all over the Midwest to try to keep voters from having a whole lot of you know power over their own constitution so 
He's uh, this piling was, up the L's. Yeah, so he, well, he was defeated soundly <laughs> yeah. in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a pretty nuanced thing. Yeah. Where they're trying to um, you know, Subvert raise democracy. the threshold and change the signature laws. This is something that you know a catchy commercial can sort of mask pretty effectively. Yeah. But it went down in flames yeah. in Ohio. 57% voted against it, 43% supported and it. And not exactly a blue state either. Absolutely. It's pretty so, reliably red at this point, yeah, Ohio. Yeah. Voters saw through uh, the smokescreen, I guess, and saw through the rhetoric and, and recognized this for what it was. Um, and I think they've left the door open for uh you know for for things like the illinois workers rights amendment mm-hmm. you know we saw that here voters spoke loudly and clearly uh and amended the constitution to the betterment of all workers and the ability to bargain uh protect their rights at work so i, I think, think i heard in illinois uh the workers rights amendment was successful in every county or maybe just a few it didn't win it it defeated it, it was more popular than uh statewide candidates in both parties in both in, parties in every, in every county. county okay um but i think there were counties where it got less than 50 percent. got it um but, but it, not it, many right it was right. it was it was the it vast was majority popular yes yeah, supported it yeah so um i think what uh what we're going to see in ohio is maybe now these folks who've been trying to silence voters and silence workers and silence people who are uh you know mindful of their government they've kind of waved a flag to say, oh, hey, we're going to try to stop you from amending the Constitution. And now you've taken people that might not have thought of that and opened their eyes and made them think, hey, how can we amend the Constitution? So, you know, we've been saying on this show for a long time that um, we've shown in Illinois that the Workers' Rights Amendment can be passed, that people will support it, that it's good policy, it's good politics. So let's see it in Ohio. You know, the, the, the table is set, so let's start to make some moves here. Um, you know, I'd like to see that. So I'm calling on you, listeners in Ohio. Yes. You know, get moving. Cleveland. And, uh, to labor Cincy, leaders out there. Columbus. You have an opportunity. It can be done, and it will work well for, uh, for all your working men and women in your state. So get after it. Youngstown. Youngstown. I'm trying to think of all my Ohio cities. Yeah, you're ending with Y. I don't know any cities that uh, start with Z. Anybody? No. Okay. Is we there, uh, there Zion, Ohio? Zipper, there probably is. Zipper, Zion, yeah. Zipper Town, uh, Zephyr, uh, whatever. Zephyr. Yeah, Zephyr. Everyone Ohio. knows Zephyr, Ohio. Everybody, all our friends. We used to vacation there as Zephyr. kids. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that's all we all the time we have for the show this week. Thanks, everybody, for hanging with us. Uh, Ken Edwards, if you're out there, call us uh, and let us know where you're at. We're, we'll give you another Ken sighting report next week. We can only imagine what kind of crazy hijinks Ken will be yeah. up to. But uh, we'll bring that to you next week. The new croc hunter. Yeah. And thank the you, Phil, for, uh, for for being here today. You're welcome. Kind of man. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So but yeah, that was a lot of fun talking about Mother Jones. It was. Yeah. So we'll be back with you next week right here on 720 WGN.